Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey folks, this is episode 152 of the Team House. I'm Jack Murphy here with my co-host David Park. Tonight on the Team House, we're super excited to have friend, author, Special Forces veteran James Morris. He's the author of a number of different great books, uh, The Devil's Secret Name, War Story. He was a correspondent for Soldier of Fortune magazine for many years. Uh, after his service in Vietnam, Jim traveled around to various war zones, Beirut, El Salvador, um, really all over the place, covering conflicts for Bob Brown at Soldier of Fortune magazine. And he continues to write to this day uh, at the age of, well, I think you're 81 or 82 now, Jim. I'm 85. 85. 85 years young. Uh, Jim is still writing, still learning. His latest book is The Dreaming Circus. I just finished reading it yesterday. Uh, the book is really about, uh, I wrote a review for it, so I'm a little introspective, I guess, or re retrospective about the book. I, you know, I think that a lot of the war memoirs out there, including the one that you wrote, Jim, back in the day, the one that I wrote, it's very much about sort of a coming of age sort of story, a soldier story. Yeah. Um, the one you just completed, the book you just wrote answers another question that not enough people address. It's what do you do with the whole rest of your life after you survive as a, as a veteran? How do you reintegrate back into society? How do you figure out what to do with yourself and how do you live a good life? And I thought the dreaming circus really makes a, a strong attempt to answer some of those questions. Uh, so I really enjoyed it. I'm glad you did because, um, uh, you know, it, it's dear to my heart. Um, the, um, the thing about the dreaming circus is that, well, the thing about it is, is when I got out of the army, I was, I needed an attitude adjustment and the dreaming circus is basically the story of my attitude adjustment, which took a long, long, long time because when I got out, I was, I was pissed. Oh, okay. I was retired with a disability and um, uh, not to be bragging, but I've got four purple hearts and um, uh, I, I lost, I lost my left nut. Uh, I lost a big chunk out of my right arm and I couldn't do what I love to do anymore. And so I was, you know, I was, working as a tech writer in Norman, Oklahoma, and um, not happy about it. And, uh, okay, along about that time, uh, I read The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test by Ken Kesey, or not by Ken Kesey, but by Tom Wolfe about Ken Kesey. And that was the story of the Merry Pranksters and the story of LSD and all of that. Um, and I got into all that because it was interesting and it was fun and, uh, it was also highly illegal. And, um, I would like to point out that, um, uh, all of the things I was doing, uh, that were illegal then are now prescribed right. to people for exactly the same purposes I was doing them. Right. Um, no, they didn't describe, prescribe the Grateful Dead, but that was a, a bonus, <laughs> I would say. Yeah, the, so, uh, um, all right, ask me a question, gents. Because well, I've, no, I, I think maybe this is a good place to start. Um, as you point out, some of, uh, psychedelics are now being used in medically supervised, uh, treatments for PTSD. It's, it's, a uh, it's getting closer to being accepted, right? We're, we're getting closer to that. Well, they, 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 they were before. They were before that, too. I mean, um, okay, my late wife, Myrna, was a patient of uh, Dr. Oscar Janiger, who was the guy who gave <coughs> Cary, Brandt, Cary Grant LSD. He gave, um, uh, I'm trying to think of this famous female author that I know as well as I know my own name. 
that's one of the things that happens when you're 85 is words just drop out of your vocabulary for about 10 minutes and you either find a synonym or uh, stand there looking like an idiot. Um, but in any case, uh, Oz Janiger uh, gave Cary Grant, Grant LSD. He was, he was already clearing space for his Nobel Prize when the, uh, when the FBI showed up and confiscated, they thought, his entire stash. I don't think they got it all. But they also got all his records. Uh, they didn't want him publishing. It was it was amazing because, uh, well, especially when you consider that uh, Kesey had got into LSD uh, in drug experiments at Stanford that were sponsored by the CIA. Right. <clears throat> so the whole hippie thing was essentially um, a, a collateral damage from CIA drug experiments. And um, I, that's, I mean, if you've got a sense of irony, you have to enjoy all of that. Anyway, yeah, I did that, and I did it for about three years. Um, and, you know, I went to, all right, we're going to be on here a long time. So I'll tell you this one time, the time that I took the absolute most LSD I ever took, I took a full hit of Berkeley Sunshine, and I went to a Johnny Winter concert. And I'm going in the door, and this hand, roughly, the, okay, your perceptions are altered. This nine-foot-tall, 400-pound policeman grabbed my shoulder, and he said, Say, hey, 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 you earned that patch? <laughs> oh, oh, I'm wearing my field jacket. And I still had the SF uh, combat patch on it. And I said, you're fucking right, I earned it. And he said, where was you at? <laughs> and I told him, you know, a couple of camps and that I had been at. And uh, he, you know, I was at Boon Bang, and then later I commanded the team at Cam Duke. And um, he said, you ever hear of B-56? And I said, oh, yeah, that's Project Sigma. You work for Rolf Udegaard. He was my demo instructor. And so he said, well, I guess you got as good an excuse as anybody. And I just went in. And <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. Anyway, uh, I did that for about three years. And then I realized that when I'd started it, I was way too uptight. And I was getting too loose, you know. I mean, I was just getting kind of. You were skydiving uh, on LSD. It, well, I did that, yeah. And anyway, so um, I didn't make a habit of it. Uh, the the guy, this is another thing, the guy who was the world champ when I started skydiving, and I'm not going to say his name because he probably did, but um, if he's still alive, he might not love me saying that this guy used to, this guy made dozens of skydives on LSD. And um, just, well, anyway, uh, but I... Truly, if anybody out there is thinking about it, I do not recommend it. Um, when I when I when I did, I actually had a malfunction. I had a right side closure. I was jumping a Fair Commander Mark One, which is a round canopy, and I had a right side closure, so I was you know plummeting to earth pretty fast. And um, so I was trying to shake it out. That didn't work. And the guy I was jumping with, he was just off to you know off about. It's only about 75 feet from me. So anyway, he yelled, get rid of it. So I, oh yeah, get rid of it. And I, you know, dumped the chute, pulled the reserve and uh, landed in uh, a muddy pond and, <laughs> and uh, didn't, didn't get hurt. So that was, that was a good thing, but I never, ever even thought about jumping out of an airplane on LSD again. Um, and, you know, after, after three years, uh, I thought, all right, you're getting too loose, dude. So I jumped my, I dumped my stash down, the, down the toilet, flushed it. And I haven't had a very little contact with any of that kind of stuff since then. Um, what was Jim, but, I, before, uh, before moving on from that, I would like to, since, you know, it is being used to treat people more and off more often. What uh? What was your takeaway from that experience with psychedelics? What What were the positives and what were the negatives um, from your point of view? Okay, 
Well, the negatives were almost every time I did it, I wound up having a conversation with a policeman. Uh, <laughs> but the positives were that, well, what they do is they, uh, all right, um, Castaneda said this about power plants. He said, um, they awaken you from the torpor of your normal everyday thought. And, uh, uh, you know, they shake you up. They, they, all right. And I just did an under, another interview with a, uh, a new age, uh, Gaia program. So, I, and I said exactly the same thing, but psychedelics will let you out of the, out of the box you're in, into a larger room. They will not let you outside. You've got to do that on your own. And uh, that's, there are a lot of ways to do it. Um, and I tried most of them. And the one that worked for me was uh, Don Miguel Ruiz's Toltec training. And I, I did about 10 years of that. Um, but the thing is, it's not 10 years before it kicks in. Things get better every step of the way, all the way along. And um, uh, I finally got to where, well, I've done an awful lot of things that if you ask almost any scientist, they'll tell you, oh, no, that's impossible. But um, they are possible, and there are other scientists who are catching on to it. There are some scientific principles that are not recognized scientific principles, but I think that they will be, and when they are, um, lid's going to be off. It's going to be great. When you came to uh, shamanism, like older in life, I mean, you were in the, like late sixties, I believe, when when you first started getting into it. And uh, no, I was in late I was in late sixties when I found a teacher. Okay, but I was I was thirty, maybe. Seven, thirty-six, thirty-seven. When I started reading, and okay. okay, I had a another tech writing job. This one was for the post office service, post office, which had a school system in Norman, Oklahoma, and so they hired me on a six-month contract to turn one of their manuals for a device a, 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 a device that read zip codes called a, a zip mail translator, and they wanted me to to convert this pro this manual into programmed instruction. So you could take a little bit of it and then answer a question and um, see wh whether, you know, uh, multiple guess, true, false, that sort of thing, and see if you were picked up and then before you go to the next section. Well, I, they gave me six months to do this, and I finished a third of it by noon the first day. So I thought, oh, golly, you know, that's not going to work. Uh, so... Uh, but anybody who's reading a hardback book with the cover, you know, with the lurid dust jacket laid aside, looks like they're working. And I started reading Carlos Castaneda, and I thought, well, no, this is really interesting. This guy's got a whole different take on life. And um, the thing was that he, what, what he called his system is the warrior's way. And, you know, I, I missed the Army, and I've thought I, I had loved being a warrior and basically what they seemed to be telling me how to do was to take the attitude of a warrior into normal life and that's 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 what I needed to do I was in a and I hated civilian life especially in Oklahoma mm -hmm. and um uh, I, you know, so I started studying this stuff. Well, Castaneda says that the basic difference between the warrior and the average man, and this is important, the basic difference between the warrior and the average man is that whereas the average man sees everything as either a blessing or a curse, the warrior sees it as everything as a challenge. And I, I maintain that that holds true whether you're a warrior in a war or you're a warrior trying to find yourself uh, in a sh with a shamanic path. And, um, you know, that's, that's the attitude, that's the main attitude adjustment, or that's one of the main attitude adjustments, 
is to uh, is to quit taking things as a blessing or a curse and take them as a challenge, and find find the way to deal with them. Um, and I started doing that. And um, the, well, and and once I I started practicing those things, I was doing I was practicing lucid dreaming, you know, which and I got to where I could do it, you know, I could. No, I was dreaming in my dreams and therefore control the dream and do things that I wanted to do. And what I found is that when you do that, uh, your astral body is kicked loose from your physical body. And like, uh, okay, and the best lucid dream I had in that thing, I checked in on my mother and it was 3 a.m. I was asleep in Norman in, at 3 a.m. And my mom was sitting on the couch in, in their in their house. Uh, she had a lot of trouble sleeping. She was a terrible worrier, my mom. And uh, uh, she got up, she threw her guts up every morning at 3 a.m. the whole time I was in Vietnam. Anyway, um, uh, I, you know, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't there. I was, not physically there, and she couldn't see me or feel me. Uh, but she did later confirm that, yeah, she'd been up at 3 a.m. that morning. And so uh, you can say, well, that was a coincidence. She did that a lot. Or you can say, well, your astral body was there and you saw your mom. That's what I prefer to believe. But, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you can go with either one. Um, so I did, you know, I did a little bit of lucid dreaming and I started going on vision quests that didn't didn't work very well I got run out of Wichita National or the Wichita National Forest I believe is what it's called and there's a there's a herd of, of um, buffalo there a pretty big one and uh, this herd of buffalo incidentally is all all um, descended from a herd of buffalo of 13 buffalo that were brought back to Oklahoma from the Bronx Zoo. <laughs> These are not wild buffalo. But anyway, they chased me out of the park. And one time I was there and I was in a, I was doing a, um, uh, a, a lucid dream. Well, what, what I got was, uh, was I, I had a, a 56 Mustang. At the, what, what do I know? 66 Mustang. And I got a, very vivid mental image of my Mustang. And I realized, okay, it's not, anyway, it, it wasn't, it was actually, it was, it was September 12th, 2000, 2001, the day I had my first, or the day I started my first successful um, vision quest. And I was out there looking for, a spirit animal and I came out with the bear, but, um, uh, that, you know, that was all right. I was at my sister Shirley's in Kabul, Missouri, and she had a, on her farm and I was scheduled to go in on the, the day after nine 11. And, um, so I'm sitting there in the morning. I have a, you know, shamanic morning ritual thing that I do. And I was doing that. And I got a phone call from uh, from this lady I was seeing at the time, and she said, is your TV on? And I said, no. She said, turn it on. Okay, so I did, and time to see the second tower go down. and No, the first tower go down. And I immediately, all right, my friend Rick Rescorla was um, uh, the, the uh, chief of security for Morgan Stanley, which was in the World Trade Center. So I called, I called Rick's office and it rang and rang and rang and didn't go through. And, um, uh, so then I, I called, there was a, a, an 800 number you could call to find out if somebody was okay. And they told me erroneously that Rick had made it, but he hadn't, uh, he, all right, to, to cut, make a long story short, my friend Rick Rescorla was the, uh, the biggest hero of nine 11. Uh, Morgan Stanley lost six people. They had, uh, I think it was 1,700 people in the tower. And Rick got them all out. 
and he and his assistant were going upstairs in the building when it came down to look for stragglers. And that's where we lost him. Um, uh, a bunch of people in the office of the joint, joint chiefs and I, we, uh, Randy, Randy Lee, mostly, who is a, a joint chairman of the joint chief speechwriter, uh, lieutenant colonel. And he and I were working to get rich, Rick, the presidential medal of freedom for, for what he had done. Uh -huh. And, um, that didn't work, but he finally did get the presidential citizens medal from, uh, Trump. And, um, if you want to, if you want to see the coin that they passed out at that thing, it's a, it's just about four feet away from me now. Um, anyway, um, uh, that was, that was a great event. To, Jim, to, I'm uh, the I, only time, the only time I've been in the white house. I, uh, I want to get back to the book. We do have to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors for the show, uh, which is sap gear. You guys can find it at sapgear.com. You want to explain to them uh, this? Uh, is it the. Yeah, so uh, one of the really cool things, Sap Gear has a lot of really cool things, but one of the thing, cool things that Sap has are these little <clears throat> uh, NFC stickers. They're the Jedbergs. Well, uh, the, the Jedberg stickers. Um, let me read their wow. copy and then I'll tell you about them. Yeah, <clears throat> an ode to the Operation Jedberg from World War II. These small near field communication stickers. So they're NFC stickers. Uh, are excellent for passing info in discreet manner between devices by proximity. Now, oh, <clears throat> what does that mean? That means that you can download an app onto your smartphone that's an NFC reader writer. Um, you can, you, you know, if you're doing covert stuff, these are great. You can put them in a book and only, you know, somebody who knows where that book is could read this tag. You can put messages on this, web links, uh, geodata, uh, geodata like coordinates, um, one of the things I actually really like doing with these is I put all my passwords on one and stick it on underneath my keyboard. So if I ever like my password manager ever gives out, I have all my passwords and they're not written out anywhere. Like these are great for storing data um, and they're discreet if you need to pass that data discreetly or want to keep that data hidden. Um, but you can get an app for your cell phone. They're a little, uh, I have a Flipper Zero that can read and write to these also. But they're great little tools um, just to have around. Super affordable. Check these out, guys. Seriously, they're great it's to have around. sapgear.com, uh, and you can enter the promo code TEAM to get 15% off. It's sapgear.com, and the promo code is TEAM for 15% off. So, Jim, back to you. Um, this your, your latest book, The Dreaming Circus, is... Uh, a lot of your books have been memoirs. They've been autobiographical. But this one I felt was much more personal, much more uh, you did a lot of interrogating of your, your childhood, your upbringing, your experiences in Vietnam, maybe in a way that you hadn't before. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that because you use these shamanic techniques to kind of go back and reassess your personal history. And I was wondering if you could kind of take us a little bit through that journey, through looking back at your past and how it in influenced your present. Yeah, the, well, the first version of this book was um, was the last half of the book, and uh, because I, you know, I didn't want to write a book about myself. I wanted to write a book about um, all those techniques, and and that's pretty much what the back of the the last half of the book is, and and how I learned them, and you know what what I did with them, and so forth. Um, but I realized that. You know, this is, it's kind of an adventure book, and you need to know who's having the adventure. So um, I just thought, all right, what you've got to do is you've got to write up every spiritual turning point in your life to show how you got to this place. So I, you know, I kind of started doing that. And some of those, uh, like how I got, into how I got into SF. Um, you know, it, there was no, uh, there was no, um, what's the word? Um, there's, there's no, there was no, pipe, there was there's no, no pipeline. Yeah, yeah. There, was, there was a Q course, but you didn't have to go through selection. There, that's the word, selection. There was no selection. I just, okay, 
I wanted to join Special Forces since the first time I ever heard of the unit, which was, I read an article about it in the magazine when I was a freshman in college. <clears throat> and um, um, so when I got in, in the Army, I immediately wanted to go to jump school. Well, son of a bitch, I had been, uh, I hadn't done anything physical for a couple of years. I'd, I'd, I'd worked. I worked my way through college, but it was all in like things like librarian and retail sales and uh, Mickey Mouse stuff. And I didn't pass the jump school physical when I went through IOBC. So I went to Fort Dix to train basics and um, started working out. And the first thing I did was I lost 30 pounds. And then I started uh, running and uh, but my biggest problem was upper body, and I, I could not do a pull-up. I could not do a single pull-up. And um, so by this time, I was a range officer. I was running the record ranges at Fort Dix, so I had a pull-up bar put in my range shack. And so I would run, uh, I would run, okay, I ran a mile on Monday, and I worked up to five miles on Friday, and then Saturday, when I didn't have to physically be on the range because it was a maintenance day, there was no firing, I would run 10 miles. Um, and in the meantime, I would run back and, you know, grab the pull-up bar and lunge on it. And that's all I could do. I just, but I kept lunging. And suddenly one day, son of a bitch, I was looking over the top of the bar. And so I thought, well, if you can do one, you can do two. The problem was I, I couldn't even do one before. So I worked my way up to 10 and went to jump school. Um, and that was the proudest day of my life was, you know, graduating from jump school. Uh, but okay. I'd promised my wife, my first wife, I'd promised her that I would get out of, I'd do my two years and get out of the army. And, um, I had, I had to go indefinite to get to jump school. I said, you can't just have, okay, we've been extended for a year, up to a year, and because of some crisis in Berlin, I forget which one, but they used to add a bunch of them. And um, so I thought, well, a year is a year, so I went indefinite. And because they, they, could, they said up to a year is not good enough, you've got to have at least a year to do. So I went indefinite. Well, then all my friends got let out after eight months. And uh, I, I was afraid that I would end up in some mech infantry unit in Germany, right. and I didn't want to do that. And uh, so I went to the Pentagon, to the infantry branch, to make it quite clear that um, I wanted to get out. And I, I was talking to this young major. Uh, he was, I think he was about maybe 30. And uh, he said... Um, have you been talking to anybody down here, Lieutenant? And I said, no, sir. And he said, well, I have here a set of orders sending you to the first special forces group. And I said, he said, it's not too late. And I said, sir, never mind. You just, you just send me those orders and I will go to Okinawa and be delighted to do it. And um, when I walked out of the Pentagon, I was laughing so hard I fell down on the hood of a car. I mean, it was just like my whole life had changed. I had gone from being a leg lieutenant to a, an international adventurer in one moment. Well, okay, that was, as far as I know, that, that was the only class that ever had non-volunteer officers in it, in the, in the Special Forces Qualification Course. And a lot of those guys didn't pan out. Uh, on my first, uh, my first team, the team that we relieved, that their, we relieved, their commander had been relieved, and the, the EXO had finished it up. Um, the um, anyway, uh, well, okay, I remember in one 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 class we took. Uh, we were all we were sitting in an auditorium, but they were, they pulled guys out of the auditorium and they put them in a situation uh, where they were to meet a hypothetical guerrilla chief and to deal with this guy. So the first guy, all he wanted was to want him to airdrop trucks to him because 
he wanted to establish a trucking company after the war. <laughs> and then the next guy wanted to be a general. And uh, the officer that was trying to deal with this guy had absolutely no idea how to do it. And he was one of those guys who was in our class who really had no business being an SF because he didn't believe in it. He didn't understand it and he couldn't do it. And, um, and I'm sitting there in the audience thinking, if somebody asked me that question, you want to be a general, I would just say, okay, you're a general. And he would say, well, are you authorized to make me a general? You're a captain. And, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the scenario, I was a lieutenant at that point. But uh, you are, you know, are you authorized to make, and I'd say, look, if you start signing your radio messages, general so-and-so, they need you. Nobody's going to tell you you're not a general. And by the time the thing is over with, believe me, you'll be a general. Not a problem. Just do it. And that would have worked. Well, it worked for um, uh, one of the one of the one of the American guerrillas in the Philippines. He was the first lieutenant when he escaped, and he was a full colonel when he came out. And okay, Don Blackburn, and I can't remember this guy's name. He was, um, but Don Blackburn, who retired as a brigadier general, he and this guy would start referring to each other as one rank higher in their messages back to MacArthur's headquarters in Australia. <laughs> and that's how they worked their way up from <laughs> lieutenants to colonels. And so you can you can do that stuff. You know, I mean, if, if you're in a guerrilla operation, you can do wonderful, wild, and crazy shit. Yeah. And, um, and also in a, in a counter-guerrilla thing. I mean... God, we used to, um, well, anyway, I, uh, the truth is I really want to tell war stories to you guys, but let's talk Jim, about yeah. we, we, look, I, we want to, we do want to hear some more stories and then, <laughs> because I think that that's all a part of you and it all like leads on this journey. And I kind of want to go back to the beginning because, you know, you, you walked, <clears throat> you know, you, you were this hardcore warrior, like you said, four Purple Hearts, right? This hardcore warrior in Vietnam. And then you got out and you you sort of um, went, you know, you became a long hair hippie. No, but you, you, you know, you found an outlet that, you know, with the LSD, you wrote the book, uh, uh, the, the Strawberry, the Strawberry Soldier, uh, was it Strawberry Soldier? Uh, Strawberry Soldier was my first book, which was also, um, it was, it, I do not recommend it, and besides that, there are like maybe five copies copies left in the world, and they'll cost you three hundred and fifty bucks. Well, then we're going to so, buy all of them um, and, and corner the market. No, no, it's a crappy book. <laughs> uh, it has a couple of good. It has a couple of good chapters, but it's it was it was a learner. Sure, you know my first three four books were learners. Sure, and um, but, uh, but that's but, Strawberry Soldier is not a good book. It's but, not. I, I tell you, I was I was in grad school in Arkansas, and I reread it after about oh maybe ten years after oh, no about eight years after it came out, and I thought this is crap. These sentences don't work, <laughs> you know. And uh, uh, so um, no, don't don't read no, strawberries. But, so but but the reason I'm bringing it up is because it, it was sort it was it was it was a little bit of your experience, right? It was a veteran. Returning home, yeah, and, exp was that. and experimenting was that. with LSD. But so, so you had this journey that that led you to shamanism. Um, but where did you start out growing up? Did you have a religious or a spiritual background before you joined the military? Oh man, it was uh, no. I t okay, what happened is my grandparents took me to a revival meeting when I was eight, and that guy's Hillstein, Hillfire and Brimstone uh, service just scared the shit out of me. Yeah. And um, so I was, uh, until I started reading science fiction, and uh, that, I was maybe 11 or 12, I ran across the word um, agnostic in the sci-fi story, and I know what it meant, so I looked it up. And from that, I learned, oh, not everybody buys into this story. Well, the story doesn't make sense. I wouldn't buy into it. The only reason I bought into it is because you know, everybody, all my authority figures said to buy into it. But this guy is saying, so I became a, you know, a militant atheist. And um, 
so, you know. Did you carry uh, that I, atheism with you throughout Vietnam? Uh, were you influenced by the, uh, by the traditions around you at all? Well, by that, okay, what I discovered in Vietnam was there's something, you know. There, there, okay, the, the incident was um, I had a, when I was PIO, I had a, or IO, we were calling it IO. They changed the names of everything. I think the Army has like 15 useless lieutenant colonels that they have changing nomenclature for no purpose other than to give these clowns something to do. But anyway, uh, I was the inf information officer, and um, I had a corner office with a typewriter, typing desk in the corner, and uh, I was sitting there uh, overlooking a sidewalk that led from um, our en enlisted club, which we called the Preboy Club. And um, I would see guys that I knew from Okinawa come walking down the sidewalk. And immediately, if I saw some guy that I knew that I hadn't seen for like four or five years, uh, I would, everything I knew about this guy would pop into my head. And every time, they would come to a dead stop in the middle of the sidewalk, look all around, not see anything, and go on. So I realized, okay, there's some, there's some connection there, and that is absolutely something that modern science said shouldn't be. Now, I know everybody has really had that experience, but... I had it like six times in exactly the same way. I went outside and, and looked at the louvers uh, that were covering that window to keep it cool inside, and you could not see inside. No way anybody out there could have seen me. But every time I would glom onto somebody, they would come to a dead stop and look all around. And like I said, that happened six times. So I knew there was something, you know, and... Um, uh, and the truth is you're not even supposed to be able to figure out what that is because it's just the did human you, mind can't did, handle it. You can did, handle some of it. You can get a kind of a concept, but you know, what you end up with is a metaphor. And, yeah. uh, I would say that our, our view of cosmology, uh, resembles the real thing about the same to the same degree that a Roadrunner cartoon resembles the Southwest Desert. You know, I mean, we're we have an idea. We can kind of manipulate that idea and and, and get some effects. We can, in fact, tune ourselves to the Great Spirit or God or Cosmo or whatever whatever name you want to give it. We can we can kind of hook into that. Yeah. But no, no way do we do we get the whole story because we can't handle the whole story. Yeah. Now, when <coughs> when you were work, when you were in special forces in Vietnam and working so closely with the Indians, were you exposed or taken interest to? Because there's a lot of Buddhism mixed with sort of their local shamanism, or you know, I'm not I'm not exactly sure, but but you know, dip, depending on which Indians you worked with, was, was there. Were you ever drawn to any of that? I was interested in it. And, um, you know, they had the Jirai tribe, which the people I was working with, they had a, um, a shaman. They had actually had several, but one of them was left. He was called the King of Fire. And I never met him, but Jerry Hickey, who was... Uh, Rand Corporation anthropologist, and he knew more. He knew more about the mountain yards than anybody else. Published two books about them, and he took Bill Foodie, our uh, junior medic, who <clears throat> who was a, a Spec Four acting buck sergeant at that time. Uh, Bill took him to meet the King of Fire, <clears throat> and he had an old French ID card with his name on it. There were quite a few. I I just kind of loved that, you know. And um, um, Bill, incidentally, retired from the military. He is the highest rank off of our team. He was a colonel in the Air Force when he retired as a surgeon. <coughs> I got this weird cough, and I'm trying to make it go away. I, um, it will shortly. We'll just deal with it for a little while. Yeah, no worries, Jim. I. I was wondering if you could tell us, there's actually maybe like, this is sort of deleted scenes from the book because you let me read an earlier draft. 
And um, you had a whole sequence in the book, the or originally uh, in, about the story in Vietnam when you got one of your balls shot off by those communists. And uh, it was oh, actually yeah, that's, a, that's a war story. It, it's actually, I mean, it's a, a really, it's a really funny story. I mean, the way you wrote it is very funny. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could share it with us. Okay, well, I was out with what became the Mike Force. Um, and there was a, a uh, an area in, in, in my AO that I, I the, the, my strike force would just not go there. You know, <clears throat> the officers, the Vietnamese officers wouldn't take them there. <clears throat> and I wanted to, in fact, I later found out <clears throat> Tom Kiernan, a friend of mine, who was the guy who, <clears throat> took the team in that replaced Donlin's team when he got when his team got shot to shit and he got the Medal of Honor. Uh, Tom had my uh, Cam Duke, my my camp, and um, he um, how he got people to go into that area was he got helicopters, loaded him up on helicopters, let him out on the other side. And they had to walk through the objective to get home. That's the only way he ever did it. So the Mike Force was going in there, and I just hooked up with them. You know, it's my first experience as a strap hanger. And um, <clears throat> that country was so rough. We were five days out and 10 clicks from my camp. We'd just start out on a mountaintop in the morning, eat lunch in the creek down below, and end the day on another mountaintop. So we had, we had walked probably 50 kilometers uh, up and down, but 10 as the crow flies. Well, uh, so we were, we were running out of supplies, and the Australian warrant officer, <coughs> Billy Baxter, who was in charge of the company, um, Billy said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to bury the supplies we got left for the next person that comes for <coughs> hike down to the road, the highway, and go back to the camp. We can make it back in a day. And um, so I went ahead and disarmed a bunch of spear traps on the trail because before that happened, I had I said, okay, we know they can hear us because you know, these helicopters have been buzzing around. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead to the, to the next intersection trail. And then what I want to do is I want to do a slow, a, sto a stay behind ambush on that trail. And Billy thought that was a pretty good idea. <clears throat> but then we got delayed a half a day because they decided to bring in the rest of our supplies. And the enemy heard that, and by the time we got to that place, they were there. So, um, every, you know, they, the, the point was ambushed, and everybody got down. And um, so I said, where's Mr. He, who was the company commander, as opposed to Billy Baxter, the Australian advisor? And he wasn't there. He was further back in the column for some purpose. And I thought, we just sit here. We're going to get picked to pieces. So... I yelled my battle cry, which is, come on, come on, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I charged this ambush, and we overran it and killed a bunch of guys, and they pulled out. Um, and um, so I'm standing there uh, looking at this expiring corpse on the ground and the, our interpreter was going crazy. He was just, he was terrified and he was screaming, kill him, kill him, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, nobody wanted to kill him. And, um, Billy said, um, I think they're up there on, on that hill. And I said, give me five guys and I'll, I'll go take a look. And so I set out and they had, um, a, a, a stairway. Uh, split logs with a, an actual, no, they didn't have a handrail, um, but a stairway going up this hill. And so I'm charging off up the stairway with these five guys. And um, so then I, I realized we're, as we 
sort of hit where you can see the military crest of the hill. I said, okay, I'm exposed here. So I jumped to the left. And as I jumped to the left, I got hit in the right shoulder. So that guy must have that perfect sight picture when he shot me. And so um, I went down and I squeezed off the, you know, the all the stories about how the M16 didn't tended was prone to jam. Well, these were AR-15s. We had those first, and they didn't have the, you know, the plunger on the side to correct the no, forward assist. jam. So this thing was just locked up solid man and it was the second okay i had had that happen on the last patrol on the first tour it didn't have any negative effects then but anyway that was the same deal of the the um the ar-15 jammed on the first round of the second magazine in the rain so anyway i'm laying there and um my guys are all down and I'm trying to fire and I can't fire and I can see this guy. And so I said, all right, give me a fucking carbine. And some guy that I couldn't even see threw me his carbine. So now I had an M2 carbine and I was looking up that hill and I could see a guy poke his head up and I shot at him and he went back down and I counted and it took, it was 10 seconds before he got back up. And I thought in 10 seconds, I can get up here and kill that son of a bitch. And, um, so when he poked his head back up, I fired at him again, and then I got up to go get him, and, and some other asshole that I couldn't see shot my left nut off. Actually, he just kind of clipped it, and uh, I lost interest in taking that hill at that point. Yeah. And um, <laughs> with, um, you know, I crawled back down the hill, and Billy was there. And I said, uh, look, if, if you want to get those guys, first of all, you've got to have some indirect fire. Get an M79 on it. And I'd been yelling, give me an M79. Nobody could hear me down the hill. So I said, put some indirect fire on it, and you can take that hill. He said, okay, good show. And meanwhile, they were, you know, bandaging up my scrotum, which at this point looked like an eggplant with hair on it. And uh, I mean, a big eggplant. And um, No bragging. Well, so I didn't brag. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I bound that up, and, and uh, uh, there was another uh, small wound on, on the right cheek of my ass that I was bleeding from, and nobody, nobody spotted that. So I, start, I tried to walk out, <coughs> but I just I lost so much strength that finally I couldn't do it. So they, they carried my bleeding ass back to an LZ, and um, in my... I did check to be sure that everybody else was out, and then I let them, okay, you know that horse collar deal that you're supposed to sit in? Well, I couldn't sit in it. Uh, I was hanging from my knees and clinging to the ring at the top of it, and uh, that's they winched me into that helicopter, and the thing was going to zoom, zoom, zoom around with me hanging on it, and but I managed to hold on until they got me into the chopper. And um, so they, they landed at Camduk, and uh, I got to see Dai on my counterpart for the last time. I really liked him. And, um, and I got to see John Kessling, my team sergeant. And uh, somebody took my Randall number one, and I never saw that again. Um, Motherfuckers. And uh, they got me to the hospital. And uh, the doctor was, he said, well, he said, okay. He said, here's the deal. Um, if you, if that nut will eventually heal, but it'll take six months. And it, it, it's not going to interfere with your functioning if we take it off and you'll be back in six weeks. And I said, okay, take it. And so um, we were lying there, and um, I was lying there, and everybody else was standing up, but I was lying there, and I said, do you know, do you know the song Johnny Small? And they said, no, how does that go? And I so I sang a little song. Oh, my name is Johnny Small. Fuck y'all. <laughs> my name is Johnny Small. Fuck y'all. Oh, my name is Johnny Small. And I've only got one ball. Fuck y'all. Fuck y'all. <laughs> and, and I came out of it missing the nut. Uh, while I was in that 
in the hospital that time. When I finally got to where I could kind of get up and move around a little bit, uh, I got, okay, I got a compliment that I would rather have than the equivalent medal. Jack Morrison, who had been the, the most decorated Australian in the Korean War, and got another DCM in um, Vietnam, was in there. And, okay, so I finally got up. And I, I gimped, there was a little bar in the hospital, and I was going to limp off down to the bar. And I ran into Jack Cade, and the night before I went out on that patrol, I, I had said that I would give my left nut for a 30-day leave, and I got a 30-day convalescent leave out of the deal. And uh, Jack said, you won't be saying anything like that again, will you, sir? I said, no, I don't think I will. <laughs> so I went into the bar. I went into the bar and there was Jack and I, you know, I couldn't sit on the stool. I had to like park the right cheek of my ass on the stool and I was drinking a scotch and water and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, uh, I'm having a drink. And he said, well, down it out. And I said, you fucking right it hurt. <laughs> and he said, by God, you're an hell of a man. <laughs> and, uh, I consider that the highest compliment I have ever received in this dude. To have Jack Morrison say that, it's worth a lot. Jim, do you want to... I just have to ask, did you ever, or how many times did you use the fact that you got a nut shut off as an opener to talk to a woman in a bar? Uh, what I usually told him was that um, uh, I was sterile. <laughs> and um, uh, you'd be amazed at the reaction I got before, uh, before the pill. Women were delighted to hear that they could <laughs> screw me and not get, not not get knocked up, and I got a I got a lot of trim like that. <laughs> Jim, can you well anyway? Can you tell us the story about uh you mentioned uh, the story about Project Delta and how it got its name? Oh, okay, yeah. Well, uh, okay. How did Delta get its name? Originally, Project Delta was called uh, Operation Leaping Lena. And Larry O'Neill, uh, who was later killed commanding a Mike Force company during Tet, but um, he uh, he was uh, the air movement officer or some such thing in the S4 shop at that time. And what he used to do um, when when a, when a Leaping Lena had a huge priority, so if it was going to Leaping Lena, he just would draw a triangle on on the boxes that were headed that way. And, uh, of course, the Greek letter Delta is a triangle. And so people started calling it Project Delta from that. That's how Delta got its name, and Delta Force got its name from that. And uh, I'm sure there's nobody in Delta Force today who knows where the name came from. But that's it. Larry O'Neill drew a triangle. It's all from the on, Greek, uh, uh, yeah, from right. the Greek triangle, which is the Delta, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And, and Charlie Beckwith was uh, the commander of Project Delta at one point before fi becoming... At one point, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chuck Allen had it when I was playing with him. And uh, um, <clears throat> I, I, was never, I was never in Delta, but I was accepted in Delta. Chuck wanted me to um, raise him a reaction company of mountain yards, which I could have done quite easily. And I would have commanded it. And, um, uh, but then I went off and got hit. So I never did get to do that. You said you, I think you wrote that you only but, got, you only got shot on the patrols you didn't plan. That's a fact. I have never, I've never had any serious, I've, I've tripped over a couple of punji stakes, but I've never had any serious wounds. I never lost a man. Uh, no patrol that I planned and led lost anybody. Not an American, not a mountain yard, nobody. And I'm really proud of that. And we weren't, we weren't slackers. We were on the trail. We killed a lot of them. Uh, we just didn't, we just didn't die. It was always the ones where when you were a strap hanger on someone else's patrol, you got hit. <clears throat> well, truthfully, they were patrols in much more dangerous places than, <laughs> uh, anywhere in Fubon province. Um, Mostly what we would do is wander around until we got shot at 
and then shoot back and they would run off and we'd try to catch them and that wouldn't work. So it took us, I knew what we needed was we needed an intelligence net so we could ambush them instead of being ambushed by them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took me four months. <clears throat> it took me four months to get to the point where I could um, organize an intelligence net. And I, I just, okay, I had this aha moment. And um, so my best interpreter was a guy named Philippe Druin. And Philippe had been fighting the Kong since he was 12 years old. He was, he was terrific. He was, Philippe was good in the woods. He was a Montagnard. And um, here's how I organized my intelligence net. I said, hey, Phil, go, fire, go hire some spies. And the next day I had my intelligence net. <clears throat> and um, that's how we got that, that ambush that we got the, you know, the, the best operation I ever ran. Um, was um, we were just sitting there by the trail and waiting for him to come by. And that's that's all I did for the last two months we were there. And, uh, um, well, that's all I, that's all, of, all the operating, I, all, all the operating I did. I was doing a lot of administrative stuff, but, um, yeah, we did, we did, we got, did that. And they're okay. The old man, uh, my CO, Cruz McCullough, who was, he's gone now, but Cruz is the best man I have ever known. Pure and simple. I named my son after him. I love the guy. Um, all right, before I tell you about his op this, oper this operation, I want to tell you about another one. He planned an operation called Operation Bat. And the, 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 the objective of Operation Bat was to reopen a road from where we were. It was an old highway that the Viet Cong had dropped trees off, and dropped, dropped trees across, and, you know, he couldn't drive on it. He was... The Vietnamese planned to take a an engineer battalion and and a year to reopen that road. And Cruz said, "I can do it in a week with our organic transportation." And the Kong owned that area, and nobody wanted to go, you know. And all the guys that were going to go, they they asked me to try and talk him out of it. And uh, the night before they were supposed to go, I said, "Sir, I believe." And there's not very many people you can say something like this to. I believe, and every man on this team believes, that you are going to get wiped out. You're going to lose a bunch of people, and you're going to you're going to lose all of our organic transportation. And he 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 heard me. He listened, and he sat there on his bunk for a half hour, thinking. And then he said, nope, I figured it out. And they went on an operation. It was a huge success. They reopened that road. Uh, they went into Plate and Anglais, which is one of our camps. Um, Billy Wall was a team sergeant at that camp. Anyway, um, so the night they were due to come back, Bill Foody was along on that job. And he said, so we're going to be going back down the road we opened. And Cruz said, no, if we go back down that road, we'll be ambushed. We're going to open another route on the way back. And so they they just went back closer to the river where it was rougher. And uh, Foodie said at one time they would, like, use the winch and they would drive a truck up a hill by winching it up the hill and driving at the same time. And then they would drop it down the other side of, of whatever was blocking the road. And Foodie said, the night they got back, Foodie said to me, I think they were afraid of him. And I said, who? And he said, the trucks. The trucks were afraid of the old man. <laughs> and um, anyway, uh, he he led one operation into uh, the area to the south down there, and it, uh, they there was okay. Um, Vern Gillespie used to have a, a, another camp down there that operated in that area, and he had been a pen pal of the VC commander until a B team commander put a stop to it. And these guys were you know were coming for you, fuck you, and that kind of thing with 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 the American commander and the VC commander, which. I just think that's 
unbelievable. Yeah. And anyway, um, uh, they got hit. Foodie got hit in the leg. Um, uh, let's see. Ken Miller, not the Ken, not not the author Ken Miller, but another Ken Miller. It's a very common name. Oh, we lost you, Jim. Oh, you're going to have to call him and tell him to <clears throat> sign back in. Hey, uh, folks, uh, stand, uh, stand by real quick. We had him on uh, phone audio, and we just lost him. Oh, we'll have to get him back. Hey, uh, everybody, uh, if you're listening, we really appreciate it. Please uh, like and subscribe to our channel. Also, if you'd like to buy us some booze or help the show keep the lights on, um, booze before lights, but uh, please join us at patreon.com, uh, patreon.com backslash or forward slash, I don't know, the team house. Um, and, uh, yeah, you get uh, free bonus episodes. And what else do they get, D? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, we've things. lost audio. They get two bonus episodes per month, ad-free audio um, feeds. Yeah, so I think you'll have to call back in again uh, like you did bonus, before. Access to bonus segments with like guys like Mike Vining, like some legends. Yeah, because otherwise we won't be able to hear and, you. And uh, um, yeah, and snacks for us. You get snacks for us, which is cool. Yeah. Patreon.com <laughs> slash the team house. The link yeah, is Yeah, I don't know what happened. There you go. And and here you're experiencing all the wonder of, of live live. Broadcasting. All right. So, Jim, uh, go to uh, <laughs> also back to the microphone and yeah. hit that little arrow. Uh, also, uh, check out uh, Jim's books. He's written a lot of books, and some of these books are legendary. If if you have not read them, um, uh, his latest book is "The Dreaming Circus," which kind of explores his journey as hey, a Jim. as from a special operations soldier to okay, so uh, experiment with to LSD to uh, being led into uh, shamanism finally in, a, in the later years. You know, not later years. I mean, he's still a young man, obviously. Um, but The Devil's Secret Name, um, War Story, Fighting Men, Above and Beyond, Silver Nail, um, Chimps with Nukes. And then where's uh, this? Telephone just a number of phenomenal books that he's written, and you can find them all. Uh, on Amazon or your local bookseller, if they those still exist. Yeah, but if you're not watching live right now and you're you're listening or watching later, all the links are in the description hey, or in the show let's notes. See, hold on, a check second. it out there. <laughs> exactly, we'll do it live. Hey, hold on, let's see if we can hear Jim. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, hold on. Yeah. Yeah, we got you. Okay. And we're back. Okay, here we go. That worked. Uh, okay, so <laughs> Jim, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> you were describing are, are the, we on the actual. Um, yeah, yeah. We're, turn we're, off the phone now. Uh, yes. No, no, don't turn off your phone. No, no, he's not dialed in. Oh, he's he's on. He he's actually on actual audio. Yes. Oh wow. Yeah, you'd hang up the phone. Um. So where okay, were you, I'm Jim? Not seeing you or hearing you. Oh shit. <laughs> Can you hear us? No. <laughs> Jim, we can hear you. It's not us, it's him. Oh, for fuck's sake, again. Modern technology. Modern technology. What can you say? Hey, Jim. It's the best. Yeah. So, hey, I'm going to need you to do the go through the process again. Go down to the microphone on the lower left-hand corner and hit that arrow. Okay. <laughs> I muted Jim. Uh, so we we can't hear Jim right now. And then where it says, like, switch to phone or something like that? Well, we can hear him. He can't. Oh, he can't hear. And audio options. Go to audio options. Okay. I'm hitting audio options. <clears throat> and the only thing I've got here, oh, it says leave. Phone call. Yeah. Yes. Okay, guys, um, while we're waiting, uh, we also 
because he's he hung up on you, right? He's got to call in on the on the audio. Yeah. So um, you know, talking about our friends at Sap Gear, some of the other great things that they have, um, and Jack and I will be taking these to, with us when we go to DevCon. <laughs> Um, because we know how those scoundrels are, but um, we uh, they have these uh, the Mission Darkness um, uh, Faraday bags, and for those of you who don't know, a Faraday bag uh, blocks all electro uh, electronic signals, so it'll protect you from Bluetooth. It'll protect you know your cell. Like if for any reason you ever don't want your phone being tracked, and believe it or not, there are legitimate reasons for not wanting your phone being tracked. Um, Having a Faraday bag is a great thing. Um, you know, dropping your wallet in a Faraday bag if you don't have uh, a, a wallet that protects the RFID cards is a good thing also. But check out our friends at SAP Gear. Check out all their stuff. They have great escape uh, stuff for apprehension avoidance. Um, uh, these NFC tags. See it, uh, Jack's Rock and his, the, one of the bracelets. Has a little handcuff key on there. Can you hear us? Oh, we are back. <coughs> We're getting a bit of an uh, echo. Uh, yeah. Give it one more try right now. James, can Jim, can you talk? Yeah. Yeah. Fuck. And I was telling, and I was telling some elaborate lie. We're getting an echo. Oh, I know why. It's because he's on here twice. Hold on a second. It's not your fault. Uh, I'm going to go to gallery. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to... You see my Patreon thing I'm... All right, how about uh, now, Jim? Okay, you muted me. Yeah, but we can hear you. We can hear you. And then you. Okay, you can hear me and I can hear you. Yes, yeah. sir. This is wonderful state of affairs. Jack, I'll f uh, full screen him. Uh, I'm, I'm so I was telling okay. the story of that, of that operation that Cruz ran down south, and... Um, Basically, uh, he got all the, all the information on the. Uh, I'm going to try and keep this kind of short. He got all the information on the upcoming Montagnard revolt. Um, took it to Saigon, and about a week later, uh, this um, super spook flew in and told us we were lying. And the old man threw him out of the camp, and then. Uh, when the revolt came, uh, well, special forces was ready for it because the word was ever, we weren't the only people that figured it out. But um, that was that was rather annoying when this guy flew in there and told us we were lying, just making this up for whatever reason. Right. I don't know why he'd want to lie about that. But, and, uh, well, anyway, so the old man threw him out. Um, I want to tell you something about my CO. Uh, nobody who knew him thought he was going to retire with fewer than three stars. And he was ambitious. He wanted to do that. He was an artillery officer. So, so when we got back to Okinawa, he transferred to the 173rd. And about a month after that, he came over to my house. They were getting ready to, to deploy to Vietnam, the first Army combat troops in Vietnam, the 173rd. And he said, Jim, we're going to lose this war, and I don't want to stick around to watch. And he resigned. Wow. Wow. What, what was the feeling? Yeah. Was, that a, was that a general feeling over there that the, that the U.S. just had no general strategy and people felt like, like uh, we're going to lose or we're, we're, that there's no definitive victory? Before, before I went to the first time, Went the first time, uh, one of our NCOs who had been told me, he said, it's going to take 30 years to win this war. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I, it, I think it's just a principle. You can win a counterinsurgency war, but it's going to take a generation to do it mm -hmm. because the people that are in charge there now aren't doing it right. And the old guys aren't going to let go. Right. And the only way you can actually win an insurgency is start training cadets, and by the time one of those cadets makes general, you're winning the war. Mm -hmm. Did you see? And, uh, and this is. I, I was going to ask you that when you know when you saw uh, things sort of going down in Afghanistan at that point, did you feel? Did you see similarities between that and and Vietnam, and then over the the long period? 
No, when we went into Afghanistan and, and didn't just, you know, kick Al-Qaeda's ass and get out, I thought, you cannot win a civil war in a country where the national sport is civil war. Mm -hmm. You know, you can take the pennant, but next season they're all going to be back out there again. Right, right, right. Yeah. Now, the, the, the sides may shuffle around a little bit, but that's what those folks do. They wage civil war. Yeah. Jim, I was wondering, could, so, you, you, know, could, uh, could you tell us the story about Operation Dumbo Drop and how all of that came to be? Because you were a big part of that, the, how the okay. film came around. Oh, okay, here's what happened. Um, one of our camps, Trabong, uh, they, they had put in a sawmill as a civic action project. And uh, they logged all of, all the logs around the camp, <coughs> and and trucks just wouldn't work in that area. It had to be elephants, so they requisitioned an elephant, and from the S five shop, and uh, whoever took the call said, "Yeah, sure, we'll do that," <laughs> and without doing anything to figure out how how you were gonna, well. Um, what we discovered, what we found out is that, okay, we had an animal tranquilizer that we used on water buffalo and uh, other animals, mostly water buffalo, but it took so much of this stuff to knock out an elephant that, <laughs> you know, you had to shoot the elephant in the ass with nine darts to knock them out, and there are not very many elephants that will stand still while you do that. <laughs> so, um, so the S5 came over to my shop, the, uh, the IO shop, and he, uh, because it, my phone was better, I guess. Anyway, we, we started calling zoos in the United States. And of course, the first thing we had to do was convince the operator we weren't drunk. <laughs> and, um, but we finally got uh, a guy at the Cleveland Zoo who told us there's an experimental animal tranquilizer named M99 that will knock out uh, an elephant in a heartbeat. And uh, so we said, okay, so we got to get us some of that. And he said, who, where do you get it? And he said, well, it's manufactured by Rickinson Sons in Leeds, England. So the next night they came over and we tried to call England from the Tron, which we finally, okay, what we finally got was a setup where we had the operator in the VAR, and that's where we lost the signal. So the Nevair operator was talking to the guy at Rickardson Sons, and he said we had to have uh, a, a narcotics import license from the State Department <laughs> to order this stuff. So then we sent us a request to the State Department, and uh, they just, of course, they just thought it was funny, but they finally authorized us. We finally got some of this stuff. And Scotty Gant, who was in the five shop, um, was the project officer on this. And he managed to buy an elephant in the trunk, and then we had to figure out how to move it. Well, the first thing we were going to do, we were going to, somebody said airdrop, and we said, sure, yeah, we can do that. It, we figured we could take 400, four 100-foot cargo chutes to, um, to lower an elephant to the ground, and we weren't going to just strap, you know, we weren't going to walk them out the door. Uh, they would be knocked out, strapped to a cargo <laughs> pallet, and the cargo pallet, well, there was a lady named Mabel Raymond Hawkins of the British Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals who just put a stop to that. I mean, she just said, you can't, and, you know, she, she thought we were going to walk them out the door. And she said it was, you know, it would crush their, you know, uh, not good for the elephant. So we said, all right, never mind. We'll do it another way. And, um, they took them in by flying crane. And as it happens, that was, they took them in when Frank Orion's covered that. And I was off covering Delta in the ash out at that point. And um, <coughs> they dropped the elephants <coughs> about two days from when Martin Luther King was assassinated. So that just blew my elephants. I mean, everybody covered the elephant drop. Everybody. There were, AP, UPI, ABC, CBS, NBC, uh, everybody, and Reuters. Um, I could go on, and um, and they all wrote it up, and it didn't 
run anywhere. It was, it was you know, it was okay. I, I, one of my, one of my projects was to convince people that we weren't just bloodthirsty killers. We actually did nice things for people. Right. Uh, you know, I built a, I built a leper colony at, when I was at my first camp. That was, I was a project officer on that. The scaredest I've ever been was splitting a jug of rice wine with the chief of that leper village off the same straw. You know, I mean, that was, that, that had an enormous pucker factor. And, um, but the, the elephant thing just that didn't happen, you know, it didn't work. So, um, uh, as a, as a PR. Right now course, it, it actually I worked. I mean, they like, didn't Disney do a movie on it? Oh yeah. Operation? We got the elephants in there. Yeah. The elephants and, got in there. Uh, yeah. Actually, actually we developed, we delivered four elephants. We delivered two to Kamduk and two to Trabang. And uh, the, Trabang was attacked and one of the elephants ran away. <laughs> but they, they still had that one elephant, I think, to work there for a while. But, um, yeah, and so their sawmill was functioning. They had a good thing going. But the, the, one you guys, uh, uh, the one you guys dropped, I mean, he got his airborne wings and everything worked out okay. No, we did not ever airdrop an elephant. Oh, it, 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 it got it got canceled it had, altogether. It happened in a Disney movie, but it didn't oh. happen in real life. Oh, okay. So they then, how him, did how did you get them in? in? Sl- we took him in sling loaded under a flying crane. Uh, oh, okay, okay. So he got his air assault wings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got. The- <laughs> yes, yes. Well. There was a little of that going on. One of our mountain yard companies got the 101st combat patch. They were pretty proud of that. Yeah, because they got flown in. Uh, well, they were, uh, I, I don't remember the name of the operation, but the 101st was committed, and, and this mountain yard company was anchoring, I think, their left flank. And they thought, well, those, that's really cool. We'll give those guys our combat patch. Oh, that's great. And so they got yeah, yeah, that was cool. Well, when we were when we were doing uh, refugee work later, uh, the State Department was enormously resistant to bringing mountain yards from Thailand to the states. But the as it happened, the Thai ambassador had been in the hundred and first, and when we we told him that one of our companies had the hundred first combat patch, that that turned that dude around, and eventually, you know, we got it was two hundred and twenty mountain yards. The first. Well, there had been like a dozen here before that. We were just here when the, when the, when uh, Vietnam went down. But um, uh, we got the first two twenty in, and then um, the same group, much easier, a couple of years later with uh, a, a co- car- correspondent. I want to give this guy credit. His name is Nate Thayer, and. <coughs> Nate was kind of the, the Hunter Thompson of war correspondents, and he found a uh, an 800-man Fulroy unit. That was the Mountain Yard Separatist Organization operating in Cambodia. And by that time, they'd been kind of co-opted by the Khmer Rouge, who they had to cooperate with just to survive. Right. But uh, we got those guys out in the State Department. They didn't give us any heat about that at all. It's just like, no, we're not going through that again. And so those guys got over and there are, I think, probably now about 5,000 mountain yards in the United States. Yeah. So, uh, and that's that's all kind of as a result of those first 200 that we got in. So, uh, I'm I'm very proud of that. And you you were very active in that effort. You were very active in that effort too, I was, right? I was a PR guy, and uh, it was a natural story. So we made. Um, you know, I, I was on every, uh, all, all the national news shows. Uh, I was on, uh, there was a show, uh, kind of a, ABC had a uh, kind of a road show, 60 Minutes, that uh, they did called uh, West, West, West 47th or West something. Anyway, was, Meredith Vieira was the correspondent on that, and she was 23 at the time. And... Um, uh, that was a great show. I wish I had a copy of it today. Uh, and, uh, so, you know, that we, yeah, we got them in. Yeah. And, um, and it worked like gangbusters. 
Now, Jim, so you said, you told us uh, uh, up top that when you left, when you retired, you were angry. What what was it that you were angry about at this when you left? I was angry about being a civilian in Oklahoma as opposed to a special forces officer in Vietnam. Yeah. Which is, you know, what I had always wanted to do and what I still wanted to do. And the closest to the best of that was when I hooked up with SOF a couple of years later. That was great. Uh, it was, you know, I mean, it was Jesus. It was fun. And, um, uh, there, there was actually only one day of it though. That was as, as scary as a bad day in Vietnam. And that was in El Salvador. Salvador was a bloody war. And, um, uh, you know, my friend, uh, Greg, Greg Walker, uh, was part of the, uh, the effort to get those guys the recognition they deserve mm-hmm. because <coughs> the army wasn't going to admit that anybody ever actually fought in El Salvador, which they most certainly did. I did. And the, the, those 55 advisors, they wouldn't let them send more than 55 guys. So they were working 18 hour days. They would send them for three months straight. They would work 18 hour days for three months straight <clears throat> doing the work of several hundred guys. And, uh, uh, theoretically they were <clears throat> allowed to carry anything but pistols. And, uh, what most of them had was like a, a Mat 49 or something like that in a gym bag. <clears throat> maybe a car 15 because you know yourself the reason that uh the um the pistol is not an offensive weapon is because it's a crappy defensive weapon yeah you know i mean it's, it's a pistol you know and if you get if you get if you if you get in a in a real combat situation where the other side has multiple automatic weapons that pistol is going to do you as much good as a big rock uh, and I'm, I'm still mad about that, that the army folded about that. There was one story in the New York times and the guy, the guy who wrote it had been a Marine captain. He must've known what he was doing. <coughs> and so they would not let guys going into a combat situation, carry anything but a pistol. And, um, I'm, I'm sure that that was a stricture that was, widely violated well folks if uh people were interested you can go watch our past episode with greg walker he's been on the show before talking about it um oh i didn't know greg had done this oh yeah yeah we've had greg on here and uh ken miller has also been on the show who you mentioned briefly so yeah there's a lot of cross well, he mentioned a different ken miller no well uh, this, this seems to be a hot a we podcast whose main job is to interview my friend so i appreciate it <laughs> <that. Yeah. laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so you left angry. Well, you didn't leave angry, but you're angry because you're now in Oklahoma, which I can, I mean, I, yeah. I, I look, I, I grew up in Kansas, so I understand being angry in that general sense. Um, <clears throat> but, but what, what like led you, when was the first time you tried LSD? Why did you try it? What, like, what were you thinking? Okay. My, <clears throat> My friend, my friend Zoltan Malachi, oops, I'm sorry, I did not mean to say his full name, uh, scratch that. My friend Zoltan, um, okay, we had, a, we had a coffee drinking group. I didn't know Russ Corla in Vietnam. I knew him in the OU writing program. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, that, that's Russ Corla's pictures on the, front of we, on, the, on the front cover of We Were Soldiers. He was a, <clears throat> a major hero in that battle, got a silver star for it. And uh, he was part of our coffee drinking group. And Zoltan was, it was mostly writing students. And we'd sit there and tell stories. And um, Zoltan, one of the stories he told was um, he had, okay, he had taken, he had been, uh, spent a year in the writing program at Iowa, which is a very prestigious literary, literary. And we we were taught by, at OU, we were taught by a bunch of old, Pulp Fiction guys uh, who were terrific. 
And anyway, so Zoe went, went for a year in Iowa and he said, these people are, no, they're just doing airy fairy stuff. I don't want it. But while he was there, he went to a, uh, a party out in the country, uh, at Kurt Vonnegut's daughter's house. And, um, uh, he, he was tripping for that party and, um, they had a blizzard. So he was going back and he said, I was driving back on a pair of the oldest, baldest tires you have ever seen. And there were cars off in the ditch on either side of the road all around me, but I was tripping and I was down in those tires and I just willed them to grip the road all the way home. And I said, I got to try that stuff. <laughs> and he said, he said Thursday. And that led to, you know, chapter one and, uh, Dreaming circus. And so, uh, and what yeah. was what so was we, your we, we, what, we did that? Can you tell me what? Can you tell us like what your first experience was like? What was there a shift? Like what what was that <clears throat> for you? Well, um, okay, uh, I started to come on in, in Zola's apartment, and um, okay, here's happened. What happened once while I was there? Uh, we had, we had gone to the grocery store and, uh, I just, uh, the grocery store was amazing to me and the oranges were great, amazing to me. And we picked up this gorgeous blonde that, um, uh, Shelly Hargis, as I call her in the book. And, um, I just immediately, of course, fell in love with her. And, um, the mascara was running back inside her eyes and running back out again. And, um, I thought that was weird. And all the little serrations on the oranges were like wiggling and all of that. And so, um, I decided I was going to eat this orange. And when I pulled the peel off, I could see the pulp inside there. And it was just like waving. And it was like, I said, I said to Zola, I said, I have discovered the orange. I'm the Christopher Columbus of the orange. <laughs> and uh, then I, I, you know, I said, but I, this thing is this huge orange planted in my hand, you know. And um, so he said, well, let me show you something. And he took off a piece of the orange and he squirted the, the, the juice or the oil in the orange peel through this candle and was like, <laughs> you know. And it was just, it was, he said, head, normal head trick. So that was, that was one thing. Um, okay. Uh, long story. Uh, after we took, after we took Shelly home, uh, we went for a walk and, um, we were just walking down the street and I passed this car, uh, where the engine was running and that cracked us up because all that power was going nowhere. And it was a symbol of, of uh, our horrible civilization where nothing really worked right. And, uh, there were like Turkish rug patterns in the concrete. And, um, then, uh, well, we, we mooched around and, and some stuff happened that's really not worth talking about. And we went to see some, some friends of, of Zolt. And, um, their name was, um, their names were, well, I, uh, Bob was this guy's name and he, he kind of, kind of looked like, um, uh, oh God, who's the movie star in the biker movie, biker head movie. See, I'm dropping things. Anyway, he looked like that. Like Peter and Fonda? he had this kind of Deanna Durbin hairdo and, hmm? Peter Fonda? Uh, Dennis Hopper. He oh, Dennis, like Dennis Hopper. Okay. Hopper. <clears throat> I missed And his girlfriend. Uh, his girlfriend was just wearing like a shorty nightgown and her left hip was hanging out. And, uh, she started telling the story about a Ouija board and how she and her girlfriend had got, got, got into a Ouija board and the Ouija board had told her she was barren and she had to look it up. I had realized by this point that this girl was perhaps the most stupid person I'd ever met. And, um, so I, my nickname for her was just stupid. But anyway, the Ouija board told her that she was going to die when she was 25 in a fire in Chicago. 
And so at that point, they locked the Ouija board back up, and I just felt so bad because I was absolutely sure everything the Ouija board had told her was true and was actually going to happen. And then I told this Ouija board story that my dad had told me about uh, my grandfather, and I was having a hard time telling his story because I was still, you know, we were way past peaking and down where you're kind of rational again, but I was still pretty screwed up. So uh, I was telling the story about my grandfather had died. He died in a hospital, and um, my dad had always wanted to make contact with the dead. So he went to these two ladies that were working a Ouija board in uh, someplace in Missouri Ozarks. And uh, they the, immediately he got in there, this Ouija board thing, whatever they call it, started hopping around and it said that, uh, and it was identified itself as the spirit of my deceased grandfather. And uh, dad said, how did you die? Because there, there was some question about that. And the Ouija board said, didn't die, I was murdered. And uh, so dad said, who did it? And the Ouija board said a guy named H. Atterbury had done it. And so, uh, so dad said, what do you want me to do about it? And the Ouija board said nothing. And, uh, it's being taken care of, but my dad's not one to let sleeping dogs lie. And so about two weeks later, he called this hospital and asked if they had an attendant named Atterbury. And sure enough, they did. Oh, that's when he went back to the Ouija board and said, what do you want me to do about it? And he was told nothing It's being taken care of. Then he went back and called the hospital again and asked to speak to Atterbury. And he said, we died. Yeah. So I said, um, okay. And somebody said, well, what did he die of? And I said, beats me. You know, Dad never said. And uh, so later when we left, because I got, I got really paranoid in there. I got freaked out. I just wanted out of that. I did not like, I like Bob and Stupid, okay, but some other people came in, and, and they just, uh, they were bad dopers. I didn't want to be there. And, yeah. And, um, so we left, and uh, then we got, uh, so he asked, you know, was that story true? And I said, well, you know, Dad told it to me for true. And um, then uh, we got uh, pulled over by a cop, and, uh, you know, he said, let's see a little ID over here. So, we, you know, we hopped over and whipped out our ID and showed him all of our filler of the community cards. And uh, he was so embarrassed, you know. I mean, he realized he had stopped two citizens for walking on the sidewalk, which is why the city put it there. And um, <clears throat> so he apologized and, and told the usual lie that we, we thought you were some guys that we think done some burglaries over here. And, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've had cops that pulled me over use that, you know, use that excuse for pulling me over about, four times so um uh you know and then we said no, no problem officer have a good shift you know and off he went and, uh, and i so, went home and that was the end of my first trip so was was that trip would you would you describe that because you've had this big spiritual journey in your life was that trip was there any sense of spirituality or or openness in that or was it more recreational well, at that time <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, my interest in it were uh, twofold because I, you know, I'd, I'd read about, I'd read, I'd read the Kool Aid Test, which is mostly about tripping for fun, but I'd also read, um, I think I'd read Aldous Huxley and I'd read some other people, and I knew that, you know, that, that people were were getting spiritual insights from it, and I wanted that too, uh -huh. and um, uh, and I'm trying to think of any spiritual insights that I did get, and mostly th those times, the one time the, the one time I'm thinking of that I did get some spiritual insights was, uh, I, I, it was specifically for that. I went to the woods, Devil's Den State Park in Arkansas, and I was tripping out there by myself, and I was uh, overcome with guilt for leaving my first wife, because... Well, it was it was a mess, and I w wasn't wrong to do it, and there was no way I was going to go back. But 
she was a good mom to my kids and she loved me and anyway I was just overcome by guilt and the spiritual insight what I got was you got to forgive yourself and go on because you can't go back mm -hmm. you know you just got to take the lesson and use it as best you can mm -hmm. And that was a that was a, a first rate spiritual insight. Could could you talk a little bit more about that, Jim? Because I thought in your in your book and the Dreaming Circus, there's quite a bit in there. I think you said you've been married five times in life, um, and you've yeah, to, you've yeah. told me in the past about you know how you led a very chaotic life in so many ways. I was yeah. wondering. Well, you know, I did, but let, okay. In in the in the married five times thing, um, I want to. Uh, um, I want to make it clear that, um, okay, when I finally discovered I was part Cherokee, I, I realized that that was, in the, in the Cherokee society, that was normal and, and it was right. <clears throat> and a lot of people in the area where I come from, are, they have it, they, a lot of them don't know they're Cherokee, but they have that, I mean, people got married and divorced like crazy in the, in the Ozarks and in Oklahoma uh, before that, my mother been, was married three times. She was widowed once, but she was married three times. My stepdad was married three times. My dad was married four times. Um, one of my sisters was married four times. One of them was married three times. One of them got married once and never would do it again. But, um, you know, I mean, so it, it wasn't weird that I got married and divorced a lot. But it also it has to do with the way I was raised. You know, I wasn't raised as a um, uh, a an athlete. I wasn't raised as a. I was raised as a as a book nerd. You know, but the books that I read were adventure stories. And then when I got to where I and I, and I wanted to have some adventures, I didn't want to just read adventure stories. So, um, but. My, I, I, okay, we moved around a lot. It was the, my year, my fifth grade year, uh, I was, okay, mine, I had hurt myself while my mom was at work. And there was no, forget the daycare, that didn't happen in those days. Um, there was no, there was nobody to watch the kid. And so my instructions were to come home, lock myself in the house and wait till she got home, by which time it was usually dark. And so that's not something an 11 year old boy wants to live through. And, uh, it, every time it, it, it affected me in the way that when I was married, I felt trapped. I never really wanted to get married, but I would fall in love with these women who wanted to get married. And then, you know, I'd be nice and I'd marry him and then I'd hate it. And then I'd leave. And that was, that was basically how that worked. This is not my favorite topic, Jeff. Yeah, I get it. Um, I just wanted to uh, kind of hash out a little bit of that because it's in the book, and I think it was part of your journey towards eventually finding Mirna. Well, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can see why you ask, and I, you deserve an honest answer. But I got to tell you, it's not <laughs> something I like to talk about. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. What what was I mean? What was the conclusion, or is part of the, part of this journey? I mean, what what were the changes you had to make in your life to lead to a, a more positive t type of relationship that you ended up having? Well, uh, okay, um, all right. Uh, this that has to do with uh, there's a there is a movie out there which you can order called uh, Dreaming Heaven is the name of it, and it's the story of a trip to Teotihuacan, and I was on that trip. Uh, now, this story, because they, they, they cover everybody's trip, and they, they couldn't do this part of mine, but I realized early on, uh, my roommate was a guy named Steve Allen. He doesn't look anything like Steve Allen, the TV Steve Allen. Oh, nobody probably remembers him anyway, but... He, he was he was a producer on this on this dream, uh, dreaming heaven movie, and so I was showing him. I got we all got there a little early, and I was showing him around Teo. And when I went to the woman's, I guess temple, there's a, a, a pavilion for women in there, and I got smacked upside the head walking through a, a passageway in that in that thing, and that was my first clue that this 
this trip for me was about my relationship with women. One of the teachers is a woman named Jenny Gentry, who is a great Toltec teacher. She's an especially great Toltec teacher for women. <coughs> but, uh, and I knew her well. I'd, I'd been with her a couple of times, and I mean, I've been on trips to her to Machu Picchu and uh, various other places, and uh, I met her at a party at Lee McCormick's, and uh, her dad had been a Marine, and he wanted to be buried in Arlington, and I gave her some connects that I didn't know anybody that could get, do, it, do it, but I knew people who knew people who could do it, and I gave her those connections, and it worked. She got her dad in Arlington. And um, so we were we were friendly, but all of a sudden, everything she said pissed me off. And the first thing was, she said, <coughs> I want you to, you're wandering around, out, when you're wandering around, we want you to take off your sunglasses, you want to get the full light. Well, uh, okay, I didn't have any clear glasses, I had very shade lenses, and, you know, my glasses would clear up when I went inside, uh, or at night, but... Uh, it, they just automatically clouded over. So I didn't have any other glasses but my sunglasses, and my vision's not great, and walking around on those pyramids is it's dangerous, and it was scary. And uh, so I kept trying to sneak my sunglasses on, and she kept stopping me. And anyway, I was just, and I just wanted to tell her to shove it, you know, I need to wear these sunglasses. And, um, so, but I didn't because I didn't want to, you know, she was a friend and I didn't want to uh, take her down a peg in front of the other students. That was just not, that was not the way to go. But one night she jumped on Steve for something in one of the last classes and I, I knew why Steve had done what he had done and she was saying he was... Um, he had cheaped out and was missing the spiritual lesson, which he should have got. And I got up in her face and I told her she was basically full of shit. And <coughs> um, that was the first time I'd ever done that. Uh, you know, all of my relationships with women, uh, my way of getting my way was to manipulate and uh, con, basically, because that's what I'd done with my mom. And... Um, that sort of freed me from that. And, okay, by that time I was married to, no, that was before Myrna and I married. And then when her health started going bad, um, okay, she was spending tens of thousands of dollars a year on meds. And I'd been married four times. I did not want to get married again. I was just, I'm, I'm through with that. You know, we can live together. We can, it, it it means as much, blah, blah, blah. But <clears throat> I realized that I could save her tens of thousands of dollars a year if she was on my GI insurance. So we got married, and it, it changed everything. Because, and I, that was amazing that we went through that ceremony, and we both felt married. And it worked, and we had quite a few good years together. And then she started going bad, and uh, uh, you know, I mean, she's her well, health bad, went, bad health yeah. went south rapidly. And you know, I mean, the first last three years of her life, she was paralyzed from uh, the solar plexus on down. <coughs> she was largely bedridden, and uh, there was no way she was. I, I didn't want her in a nursing home. And I tried an assisted living, and that didn't work out. And so I sold her house. Thank God, I sold her house. She had bought it for a quarter of a mil, and housing was crazy. And I sold her house for almost a million bucks. And I had enough money to keep her alive in, a, in, in another home with hot and cold running caregivers and everything she needed as best we could and people there who loved her 24-7 uh, for the last three years of her life. And that's how long she, she lived like that. And uh, uh, you talk about solidifying the Toltec stuff. And okay, 
um, what happens when you get through the, the Toltec training and they say, okay, you're now, you are now a warrior hunting power. And I was hunting power for Myrna. And okay, I have, I have this theory, uh, like Miguel could do stuff like make the fog come and go away. And, <clears throat> you know, he's done that and he's, he's, he did a trick one time at Machu Picchu where they were in a lightning storm and he would point and that's where the lightning would strike. And then he would point again and that's where the lightning would strike. And uh, I asked him how I did it. And he said, well, you know, if you, if you clear your mind, you're connected to everything. If you clear your mind and get, get rid of the internal dialogue, uh, the, um, the universe will tell you things. And he said, I didn't make the lightning strike. I just knew where it was going to. And, um, you know, but those kinds of things. Well, the, the powers that you're not supposed to have that I started picking up were healing powers because Myrna was, she was dying and she was panicky about it. She did not want to die. And I learned I couldn't save her life. Uh, but I could make the panic go away. And I learned a couple of healing techniques. The one that worked the best uh, was called the emotion code. Uh, I picked that up off uh, a, 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 an interview show on Gaia, <coughs> the one I just was on. But anyway, uh, it, it, it's, it's a great technique. I use it daily. Uh, on, you know, I'm still doing I picked up a lot of healing skills. <laughs> Gents, I'm going to have to eat my second cough drop. <laughs> no worries. And yeah, well, here it is. Um, hey, can you see me? Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. yeah, we got you. Yeah, we got you, Jim. Okay. Okay, if you got me, that's good. I'm going to. Um, yeah, I somehow knocked you down. But there you are. Okay. You're back. No, we, okay. we have you. Um, so, Jim, I was wondering if you could describe, there's a series of uh, techniques in your book that you talk about. Uh, some of the ones that stand out in my mind, uh, you, talk about okay. in, you talk about intent, uh, personal history, uh, dreaming. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about some of those, some of those like tools that really like helped you. Sure, sure. I'm, del I'm delighted to. Um, okay. Most of this I got originally from Castaneda, although Don Miguel's people all do all of this stuff. Um, and some, but somewhere in Castaneda, his teacher, Don Juan, says, the key to all these matters of sorcery, which is what he calls it, uh, is stopping the internal dialogue. Um, in other words, to still your mind, which is what you do in um, meditation. But the Toltec techniques, they, they have a lot of ways that you can do it while you're out and about. Um, one of them is like listening to the sounds of the world. Just tune everything, tune in to the sounds around you. Another one is, uh, okay, Castaneda calls it the right way of walking, but the version I, call, I learned is called the sensory walk. I used to walk in Topanga State Park every day. I love that. And... The first thing you do is let your eyes go wide. You know, you're not focused on any one point. You just kind of take in everything. And then the next thing you do is open your ears up. And the idea is to, to melt into all your five senses, feel the breeze, hear the words, look, look at a wide angle thing until there's so much sensory input coming in that you can't think. You just can't think. And when you do that, you step into another world. Basically, you're tripping. You know, I mean, it's, it's like, it's a lot like where LSD used to take you, but you don't need any, any drugs to get there. And you, you don't have any thoughts for a while, but when you come back, the thoughts that you do have, they're better. They're insights. They're useful data, things that you can make your life better with. 
<clears throat> and I'm telling you, uh, when I would go walk to the park, I used to walk past this house. It had a big, thick wall around it. It was must have been worth maybe two, three million bucks. And this guy, they had, they had some dogs. I mean, like bad dogs that would run out and snap and snarl at you. But when I was doing a century walk, when I walked past that house, they would they wouldn't come out. They didn't sense that I was walking past the house. And um, at one time, I got almost past, and then the thoughts kicked back in again, and then they came out snapping and snarling at me and trying to eat, eat their way through the fence. And um, there were deer in the park. When I was in that, in that situation, I could walk right up to those deer. But one time, uh, I walked in there, and I wasn't doing that. I was writing a story in my head, and it was a combat story. It was just one of the SOG operations that, um, <clears throat> I, well, it was, I hadn't been on it. Uh, I was never a part of SOG, but um, Delta did the same thing, only in Vietnam, not over the fence. And uh, I'd, I'd been out with Delta, and, you know. Anyway, I knew what I was writing about, but it was, it was violent stuff. Uh, and I just had all these violent thoughts in my head, and the deer took off like when I was like a hundred feet from them. And if I had, if my mind was quiet, I could walk right up to them. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's one thing. Um, intent. Okay. That was a hard one for me. <clears throat> uh, but it's what people are calling now the law of attraction. And, uh, well, what the law of attraction is, is that which is like unto itself is drawn. And if, if you have a goal, and you're not resistant, um, you'll get it. And most people are, are like full of resistance. The minute you want something, I mean, I did this for years. I couldn't get published because I wanted it too bad. You know, I just, I, I just, it was like I was just all choked up about. And the only times I would get published was when something so horrible would happen that I'd forget about that for a while and then the stuff would start coming through. <clears throat> and, you know, uh, science says this can't be, but uh, they will say that it is because it is. And um, how it works, okay, um, we live in a, in a, in a field. Uh, Jung calls it the collective unconscious. Uh, Carl Jung, the psychologist, um, psychiatrist, I guess he was. Um, and uh, every, all knowledge is out there. All of it's out there, and you can access all of it if you know the techniques. And the first one is to quiet your mind. And when you do that, you can make things happen to you. I found this apartment that way. I found the house I moved Myrna into that way. I looked at one house in all of Los Angeles, and okay, I, 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 here's how I did it. I pulled up, I pulled up the ads, and I muscle tested them. And uh, okay, if, if you do this, that's no. If you, if they stick, that's a yes. And I muscle tested every three bedroom rental in Woodland Hills. I only got a yes on one. I looked at it; it was perfect. I rented it. That's uh, that's one thing. Um, I don't know. Well, uh, I've done more. Than, I've done a lot of stuff. I've like got cars that way. I, oh, uh, Myrna's principal caregiver was a guy named George Hernandez, who was just coolest guy. Um, and I found him with my. Oh, well, I found the agency by muscle muscle testing, and they sent me George, and he was great. He made he made Myrna he he finally got rear-ended and got his spine compacted and we had to replace him. But uh, for about two years, he did more to make Myrna's life happy than anybody else, and um, he was terrific. <clears throat> George was enormous. He could he could pick her up and just put her in his car. He had a he, he weighed about four hundred pounds and he had a Crown Vic, and uh, so. Uh, 
he would take her for rides. That's how he got out. That's how she got out to see the world. Um, he was wonderful, and I found him with muscle testing, which uh, I started doing that with the emotion codes, which is when I was hunting for power. That was one of the healing techniques that I picked up. Okay, uh, what are we covering? Free, we covered, freeing yourself um, from personal history was another one. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, well, this would seem to be a contradiction. Erasing personal history, uh, this is Castaneda's thing. Miguel's not that big on it. Uh, but the idea is that once people have an, uh, an image of you, um, you are, uh, you're kind of a, a prisoner of it. <laughs> you know, people are going to, um, make you act like your image of them and you kind of fall into it or you kind of start believing it yourself. And his, his idea is. <clears throat> if you want to be a successful shaman, you've got to kind of create an aura of mystery around yourself. So how you do that is by avoiding personal history. <clears throat> um, this cough will go away in a minute. Um, and let's see. Lose self-importance. That was, that was a hard one for me. And I, I finally realized... After I actually, I was writing the last chapter of Dreaming Circus, and I realized that I I wanted that to I wanted to sell the book. I wanted it to be a success, and I realized no, that's that's self-importance. You know, you're you're trying to trying to it, 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 nothing is important. Nothing. Uh, Nothing at all is really important. And whether you sell this book is not important. Whether the book sells is not important. Whether the book success is a, is a success is not important. Everybody who's ready for it will find it somewhere. And if you get the book out, maybe some people will find it that way. But they'll find it anyway. And um, so that was an enormous clearing for me. And, you know, they say you, you, this is a spiral. You go this spiritual advancement thing. You don't go, you go. And that was another round on the spiral for me was to start over with the very first lesson I learned from Castaneda after I'd done all that stuff and written all that book. And, <clears throat> and I have to say, I, I think I've moved on a little bit past that and, and picked up a few more things and, can do a few more things that I couldn't do before. Outside of the phenomena, uh, like the muscle testing and, and, and the mindful walking and things like that, <clears throat> what, what has this done to like, to your personhood, right? To, to, <clears throat> to Jim Morris, the Vietnam veteran, the, you know, all these things, what has that all this done? Well, I used internally? To, I used to be just just eaten up with, and I think most people are just eaten up with my thoughts, with things that had happened to me that um, were uh, this constant buzz in my head. You know, it's, and that son of a bitch, and if you was like, why do? You know, you're, all this stuff is just going on in your head all the time. Not now. Not so much. And um, my life is like clear sailing. You know? <laughs> I, I'm, what it's done for me is to make me happy most of the time and teach me how to get happy when I start not being happy. Well, Jim, back to my... So uh, that's why I think it would be... Back to a little bit like my introduction to the show and that I, I, I think there's a lot of books out there and stories of war and et cetera, but I don't think there's many that like inform. I mean, maybe there's um, uh, the Hakaguri, um, a few books like that about the samurai that are about, uh, have information in there about the, for the returning yeah, samurai. Yeah. Um, what, what advice would you give to these guys out there who are, who are military veterans and they're going through the same experiences, the same sort of anger that you had when you were a younger? Okay, the, 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 the advice I would give them is there is a way. There is a way. 
and it's going to be different for everybody. I mean, you know, for some people, they can find it in evangelical Christianity. And uh, if that's what works for you, go for that. Uh, some of them can find it in shamanism. Some of them can find it in Roman Catholicism. Some of them can find it in Buddhism. Some is some of them can find it can find it in a in, in a meditation course. Uh, my friend Morgan Ayers, who is um, uh, also was a former Green Beret, uh, who is one of the only guys that I know that's really interested in this woo woo stuff. He found it uh, with with Tai Chi and that kind of stuff. I mean, he really got into that. Qigong, Tai Chi. Um, and those guys, uh, you know, they'll teach you to fight, but they'll teach you to fight calmly. And um, so there is a way. Now, I can recommend any number of Toltec teachers. You know, if you've got a, uh, if you've got a substance abuse problem, call Lee McCormick. If you're a woman who's been humiliated or misused in some way, call Jenny Gentry. Um, if you, uh, if you, uh, Don Miguel's sons, uh, Jose and Miguel Jr. are great Toltec teachers, super Toltec teachers. And the last time I went to one of his meetings, I picked up a, a, a one sentence that I picked up from, uh, from Jose, which was, he said, the minute you learn to love yourself, your life will change. But it ain't easy to learn to love yourself, particularly not if you're carrying a lot of PTSD. Mm -hmm. But that's true. Now, if you if you want to learn that lesson, um, he'd be a good guy. He'd be a good guy to go to. Now, um, uh, Jose is he's he's a rocker. He's a he's a he is a very modern young man. Now his brother is. Uh, Miguel Jr. is is serious. Before before uh, Miguel talked him into teaching, becoming a Toltec teacher, he was uh, a real estate broker. So he is he's really grounded, and he's okay. There's two <clears throat> there's two paths <clears throat> two paths two shamanistic paths. One of them is called uh, dreaming, and the other one is called stalking. And uh, I'm mostly a stalker. Uh, Miguel, Miguel, or no, uh, I think Miguel is junior is mostly a stalker. Uh, Jose is a dreamer par excellence. He's the most amazing guy. And he can, he can, he can take you places. You never know you could go just by listen, just the way he talks. And, uh, I've heard him many times go off on one of his sermons and the things he says, really don't make a hell of a lot of sense, but it doesn't matter because they will put your head in the place that you can't get to almost hardly any other way. Mm -hmm. uh, these guys are amazing. And um, so, you know, uh, I don't think there's any central compendium of Toltec teachers. Uh, but if anybody can get in touch with me, I could probably get you hooked up with one who can do you some good. And uh, if you're in L.A., I, I would teach you myself. You know, I could do that. Um, so uh, what was it? The, the big lesson is there is a way. If this isn't the way for you, you know, see, if, it's got to be the right guy. You know, that's the thing. It's not it's not evangelical Christianity or a Catholic priest. It's the evangelical preacher. It's the right Catholic priest. But if you set your intent for it and don't block it with and with anxiety, it will happen. That's another one of those things which is absolutely true. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And it took me years of reading about that stuff before I was ready for a teacher. But um, when I was ready, there was Miguel. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to I wanted to bring that up, Jim, because I, I sent you in the uh, email yesterday. Actually, that I, I feel like you and I are maybe on the same track in many ways. Because 
we, we were both, I mean, even just what you were saying about, you know, a single mother uh, growing up reading adventure novels and deciding you want to have some of your own, being in special forces, becoming a writer afterwards. And now here I am, I'm almost 39 years old. And when I when I read your book, and I think that um, I, I I can relate and, and accept some of these mental exercises and meditation, but when it comes to some of the more I guess you'd say new age sort of concepts and astral projection, this is where my skepticism I guess comes in. Not that I'm saying like you said, if it works for somebody, it works for them. I'm happy for them. But my, my personally, I'm a super atheist like you were when you were younger. And I wonder when I, in another forty years, do you think I'm? Am I going to get to where you are, Jim? <laughs> well, okay. Here, uh, Ken Miller's an atheist too, so we have we have this discussion. I'm not. <laughs> I've said everything. I've said this before, but <clears throat> if you consider the universe an effect, then it must have a cause, and. We don't really mu know much more than that. We sure. call that God, but we don't know much more than that. Or we call it the but Big Bang, the, but... The, 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 yeah, yeah, all of that. What, what is that? Uh, okay, <laughs> Here, here's, something you, here's, something you can't, here's something you can't do. <clears throat> try, try and think of something beyond the universe. You can't do it. Your mind mm. won't handle it. Mm. Try and think of... The, of of no universe. Try and think of what it would be like if there were absolutely nothing. You can't do it. You know, the human mind cannot conceive of that. You have to use other, other, some other facilities in rational thought. And um, uh, the main trick technique, of course, is to quit thinking, rationally or otherwise. And okay. Um, Part of Castaneda, I go back to him a lot because he really wrote it all down really well. I don't think I could have been a student of his. He was nasty to his students, and, and I, I'm, I'm way past hazing. I don't go for that. But, um, okay, he says <clears throat> that the universe has two main compos components, which he calls the tonal and the nahual. Uh, Miguel calls uh, the tonal the dream of the planet. Or your personal dream, and, and in other words, the tonal is everything, and the nawal is everything else, because what the universe that you're con you're cognizant of is bounded by your senses, you know, and the senses interpret a band of vibration. The world is the, the world as you see it doesn't exist. What makes it is all your the gadgets in your head that, that bring it into uh, perception and bring it into your perception. But you have to understand that there's there there are vibrations beyond that where your senses don't go. Uh, we perceive in three three dimensions, four if you count time, but there are infinite dimensions. And um, uh, you don't <clears throat> have direct access to them. But if you stop the internal dialogue, you do. Mm -hmm. You have access to, to them all. And, um, but, you know, you don't get it all at once, but you pick up bits and pieces here and there. Uh, Castaneda says people bring gifts back from the Nepal. Well, they're not physical gifts, but they're ideas. They're, that's, you know, I mean, that's Einstein conceived of the theory of relativity in a dream. In other words, he pulled his theory of relativity out of the Nahual. You could also, well, anyway, um, that's, that's where all that stuff is. And <clears throat> all of these Every religion, you know, like if you if you actually pray and really live and you expect an answer, well, you get one. That is an excursion into the Nahual. Um, okay, am I am I am I clear here? Because I I really didn't. You're, 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 you're yeah, saying yeah. that there's something beyond the material world that we perceive. 
Oh, well, okay, and you, you have to agree with that because it's self-evident, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't see atoms, but we know they're okay. there. You know, it's true. So um, <clears throat> what you need is, is a means of access to that. And um, to access that, you have to quiet the internal dialogue. And, you know, uh, all, I mean, a lot of the New Age world is just insipid. I'm sorry, uh, I, but uh, it is. And, but it's, there are real insights there. There is real value in it. And there are wonderful teachers out there who are no part of insipid, you know. But you don't, what you don't want to do is just turn yourself over to somebody. You know, say, okay, this guy's got it. Like a cult. And no, yeah. no, keep your critical faculties. Test right. everything. Right. You know, all the way through. Be careful. Uh, because you can go you can go wrong in this stuff and get yourself really screwed up. You can go crazy doing this stuff. So it, it but you can also find the answers you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it's tricky, but it's real. And um, you know, I love all of my people. I want to give a, a, a shout out to uh, one of my teachers who is I haven't mentioned Heather Ashamara, who is just fabulous and she has taken me through so much and showed me so much and I've learned so much from her that I don't want to finish this without mentioning her but Jack if you were going to go looking for somebody I'd send you to Lee McCormick because you and he would get on like a house of fire <laughs> he is a cool guy there you go and, Jack um, enlightenment right around the corner there you buddy. go <laughs> Well, <clears throat> look up his website. You'll have fun on it. All right. All Lee right. McCormick. I'll take Friend a look. him on Facebook. You know, you'll get a sense of who he is if you do that. Jim, this book, The Dreaming Circus, it's out now. People can go and pick it up on Amazon. I should also mention you wrote a novel called uh, Battle of Sorcerers, which is a, 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 a fictional novel about Toltec sorcery. Uh, I guess a, a little bit about what we've been talking about here tonight, right? Well, yeah, it is. Uh, I'll tell you how that came about. Um, my sister discovered that we were part Cherokee. And I started reading up on Cherokees. And I, I learned a lot about, you know, their Cherokee um, shamanism and, and that kind of stuff. And um, But I really know the Toltec thing. Well, I found out from a friend of mine <clears throat> that the FBI had so many, uh, this was some years ago, the FBI had so many agents investigating the finances of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma that they had built them their own Holiday Inn. Wow. And I thought that was that was just amazing and, and really funny. And in my, in my uh, atheist days, I was going to write a... Uh, a satirical novel, a satirical gospel, a satirical novel about the story of Jesus. And I could never, I just couldn't make it work. It was, it sucked every time I did it. But when she told me that, I thought, okay, if you make your, if you make your Messiah character, a Cherokee uh, medicine man, and uh, the Romans are the FBI and the, uh, Pharisees are the Ketowa Society, which is a really conservative um, tribe within the tribe of Cherokees. Um, you you can tell the story that way. So that's that's what I did. And the uh, but the hero of it is a, uh, a retired special forces warrant officer, DEA agent, and the FBI is trying to get this guy to frame our Cherokee sorcerer for um, for peyote which he doesn't use. And um, uh, my guy my guy switches sides, and he just becomes this guy's apprentice and resigns from the DEA. And mm -hmm. uh, Well, I don't want to give the plot away. Uh, it, 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 well, you read it, Jack. Tell him it's a fun book. Yeah, people can go pick it up on Amazon. Uh, it's cool. And uh, just a couple uh, user questions here. Clanine, thank you. 
another viewer asks, uh, did Jim ever try mushrooms as a warrior shaman of sorts? Yeah. I, I, I wanted uh, to ask you because you I, what I have found what I have found with shrooms is that I can get in exactly the same place with meditation techniques uh, without you know buying a bag of buds. Yeah, and, and I wanted to ask you about that because you'd mentioned LSD like when you had first come out of the army, it was kind of popular at the time. But through the like this the shamanic journey that you've taken, I wanted to ask you about other hallucinogenics, about you know mushrooms, ayahuasca, things like that. Have you tried those? Do you recommend them, or do you think that I haven't, I haven't tried ayahuasca? I've, I've taken, <clears throat> and I haven't tried. Well, I haven't tried DMT as DMT. Uh, when I was in Peru, I uh, smoked some salvia, which that was weird, and. Uh, uh, the principal ingredient of salvia is DMT, so I guess you can say I've done DMT too. But um, uh, yeah, I've done shrooms. Uh, I haven't I haven't taken peyote. I have an offer from some Comanche dudes in Oklahoma to, to take peyote, and I'm still thinking about it, but I haven't done it yet. Um, but you know, most of those things, I can say that. Things like vision quests, um, uh, things like some of these, uh, like right way of walking and some of these other techniques, you don't need psychedelics. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe some people do. I needed them to break me out of, I mean, I was a squarehead when I started all this stuff. And, um, uh, you know, I needed something to break me open and make right. that. Uh, but... Uh, that's all you're going to get out of that. It's not, I don't think. Now, what people have said about ayahuasca, that maybe that's that's a different thing. Um, <clears throat> incidentally, do you guys know how you become an ayahuasca shaman? No. I don't. Okay, I, a friend of mine told me that. Um, if you set out to become an what it takes to become an ayahuasca shaman is that every ayahuasca shaman who is out there and is aware of your existence tries to kill you psychically and if they can't do it then you become an ayahuasca shaman interesting brutal <laughs> yeah interesting. yeah they're not kidding uh john says here's a question for you jim do you feel your generation of soft personnel are harder than the ones that came uh to age during the global war on terror era um no, I don't think we're harder. Uh, we may be crazier. You know, I mean, uh, okay, for instance, when I was in, the, the number two guy on the team was the first lieutenant. We didn't, have, we didn't have the warrant officer. And we had old captains. We had, you know, captains would come into SF who had 10 years experience in the infantry or uh, one, of our, one of our best A-team commanders was um, Happy Yoakum. Thanks. who was the medical service corps officer and he didn't want to go back to the hospital. He wanted to you. run 18 and he was great. Um, <clears throat> and also we had a lot more freedom. I mean, okay. Where, when my first team, um, we were in, we were in two corps, which was 40% of the land area of Vietnam. Well, when they, at that time we had, we didn't have the fifth group. We had, USA SFV, USA Special, US, US Army Special Forces Vietnam. Uh, we were still sort of indirectly working for the CIA, not for MACV. Um, and uh, they had a B team in each core area. So we had one B team over all the A's in each core area. Uh, well, in I Corps, they had six A's. But in, B, in uh, two core, we had 26. Not A teams, but those guys didn't tell us what to do. It was all they could do to get, you know, to keep us supplied and handle our paperwork. Uh, we, we were, we were operated absolutely freely. Nobody told us what to do. Mm -hmm. And we had one of the most successful teams in, uh, in two core. I, I think it may have been the most successful team in two core. We had the highest skill ratio, uh, which wasn't high because we were still, you know, doing 
small unit raids and ambushes. Um, but, uh, you know, and we were always out. <clears throat> Most teams were sending two Americans on a patrol with a company of mountain yards. We sent five. But we had an officer with every company size patrol and an NCO with every platoon uh, because we wanted that kind of control. And it worked for us. Um, anyway, uh, I'm getting sidetracked. I, I think one no, of the big I don't think differences. We were harder. I think one of the we may have been crazier. I, I think one of the big differences, uh, Jim, also is that uh, the technology was not where it is today, and because of that, we oh, asked. Hell no. Yeah, we we asked your generation of soldiers to do things that were crazy. Mm -hmm. um, that that would just not happen today. Right. Well, you know those pictures I sent you of me playing war in, in Vietnam and all that? Yeah. In the first one, you'll notice I'm carrying an M2 carbine. Yeah. You know, that's that. I carried an M2 carbine for four months, my first four months in Vietnam. The radio we used was an ANGRC-109, but it was the same radio that the OSS used in World War II. Yeah. They called it the RS-1. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, so... Yeah, you guys have got better gear. No question about that. Um, <clears throat> it, it does bother me that, um, well, uh, you know, you, if, they, if they're doing it like, like they were doing it in 67, 68, uh, the guys that they, you know, guy goes through training, a captain, you got to be a captain as an officer to get into to, to go through the course, and uh, your first assignment you're going to be an A detachment commander, and so you're leading eleven guys who are more experienced than you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I mean I'm sure those guys are good, and you know they they've got an, but they're not. <clears throat> They spend a long time listening before they start talking, I would imagine. So, Jim... So, that's that's a concern. I, yeah. I guess, you know, starting to kind of wrap up here, I know we've kept you for a few hours now. What are the, what are the big points? What are the big salient... Hey, this is the most fun I've had this week. This is great. Okay. I've had a lot of a lot I'm, of good time. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I really am, yeah. and I've been looking forward to having you on this show for a long time. I mean, we talked about it like nine or ten months ago, you know, before the book came out. Yeah. And we planned it this way because the book came out, what, a week ago? Uh, it's actually not out. It's, it's It came out a couple of weeks ago uh, in Kindle. Okay. Okay. Uh, and it'll be out on the on the 22nd is, is the date they've given me in, in, uh, in the hardcover. I, again, guys, the book, this book, is The Dreaming Circus, Special Ops, LSD, yeah. and My Unlikely Path to Toltec Wisdom. Um, you can get it, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I hate to plug Amazon, but I feel like that's where you buy the everything. The Mighty Zon. Right? Um, but also, like, do yourself a favor. You can order it direct from Baron Company, the publisher. There you go. Down Just with go, our corporate masters. Go to the masters. Baron Company website and order it direct. Um but I also really want to highly recommend all of Jim's other books, including Strawberry Soldier, which uh, goes no, for... <laughs> no, don't recommend Strawberry Soldier. I'll tell you the good ones. I'll tell you the ones you should read. All right. Um, War Story, uh, Fighting Men, The Devil's Secret Name, and Above and Beyond. Those are my good soldier books. The others are were learners. Well, and a battle of sorcerers—that's worth reading. Yes. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Uh, if you're interested in this shamanic stuff, that's good. Yeah, yep. that's good too. Yeah, yep. war story is uh, one of my favorite uh, Vietnam memoirs, and if you can tell, I've read a lot of them at this point. <laughs> you know, but war story yeah. was one of my favorites, and it really resonated with me. I read it just kind of as I was getting out of the army going through and feeling a lot of the same things you did, Jim, and reading your book, it really struck me. I mean, you can take Vietnam and replace it with Iraq. You can take communist and replace it with terrorist. And the special forces experience was nearly identical between the two conflicts. And um, 
I, th- I gotta tell you I gotta tell you this. I got I met a guy from Iraq who'd been in Iraq and his team sergeant gave him a copy of War Story and said, <laughs> Here, read this. This is how it's done when it's done right. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh it, it really that book really resonated with me. And um and yeah, so I definitely hope people Thank will you. go and check it out. So Jim, what are some of the okay. salient what what are some of the salient points that you hope people take away from the Dreaming Circus? <clears throat> there is a way. Oh, from the Dreaming Circus? Well, same deal. There is a way. Uh it may not be the shamanic path, but if you can, here's here's some leads to that. And um and I gave them some leads to the, some other things. Of course, a miracle is great too. <clears throat> but you know, you got to find the right way for you. And but there is one. And whatever it is, you can find a way to live a happy life. It's there. It is there. There's so many people I think need to That's hear it. that. Yeah, because uh, if you look at our. Our rates of suicide, substance abuse, all the horrible shit that, you know, we all know is out there. Um, yeah, I really hope that message gets through to people. Well, you know, some of the things I've said, like um, the key to all these matters of sorcery is to silence the internal dialogue. You find a way to quiet your thoughts, and you can do it just by listening to sounds. Uh, you can do it with meditation techniques. Uh, you can do it by walking in the woods, but that is the absolute key to all of this stuff. And if you learn intent, you can use it to build the life you want. Jim, That's, thank you so much, you know, man. It's it's you know you're such a legend and a, such an honor to have you on uh, to share your story with people. Like we, we we're so humble and we're, we're so appreciative. Well, the, you know, Dave, I'm I'm delighted to hear you say that because, um, I knew Jack. I knew Jack liked my stuff, but I I had some concern that you might think I was crazy. So I'm really <laughs> glad to learn that you do not. No, well, Jack will tell you. I I I know. Like I've I've read Carlos Castaneda's stuff. I've read Dan Millman's. Like I've read. Like all of that, yeah. Um, you know, Jack will tell you that I, you know, I, I've, I have a fairly deep education. A lot of that stuff, so it's all very fascinating. Yeah, excellent. <clears throat> well, listen. The first thing I did when I was, uh, you know, t- teach uh, doing the sorcery, I did a. I took all the teaching parts of the first four Castaneda books, and um, edited them into a manual. Mm-hmm. And I will be perfectly happy. I'll send that. Uh, I'll email that to Jack, and he can pass it on to you if you'd like. Yeah, sure. perfect. Love it. Love it. Okay, and, I'll do it. And and if you were willing, we'd love to share that resource with, with you know, I, particularly veterans, but anybody who who's looking for it. If you're willing, I don't know if you want to keep that close hold until you publish. I'll send it. it. I'll send it to anybody. Nobody. I mean. It's all copyrighted material. I can't make money off right. of it. Okay. But nobody's complained about my showing it to people. It's a compilation. So. Understand? Yeah. Yeah. Jim, I know yeah. you're. Uh, I don't. You don't strike me as the person that can ever stop writing until uh, they nail your coffin shut. What's What's the next book? Not if I can help it. Not Not as well. For one thing, it, it actually keeps my mind working. Good. Yeah. <laughs> and. Um, you know, I mean, hey, I'm 85 years old. I'm rated 80% disabled by the VA, and I'm living a pretty normal life. Yeah. And that's that's a miracle enough in itself. Now, are you sterile, still sterile, though? Like, <laughs> are you still using that in bars or what? Uh, I don't have to, but my girlfriend's glad. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, what, what's the next book that you're working on? Um. Okay, what I'm, what I, okay, here's something. A while back, I was, I got out this, I wrote a novel kind of based on my second marriage. Um, and it's my hippie book. And, uh, I got it out and reread it and I thought, well, this needs some work, but it ain't bad. <laughs> and so I've taken about a year and I'm just almost through to start trying to sell that thing. It's called Love in Vain. 
All right. That's a good title. I'm looking forward to reading yeah. it, Jim. Uh, again, man, thank you so much okay. for doing this. This has been a great conversation. Uh, any final thoughts before we, uh, we, will we let you go tonight? Other than just to thank you both for hopefully doing some good and for sure having a good time. And, uh, um, Thanks a bunch. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'd love to do it again sometime, Jim. I, I can listen to some of these. I, I know that you're maybe a little bit over the war at this point, but I, I love hearing these war stories. <laughs> That's why I keep asking you about yeah. it. <laughs> <clears throat> well, you know, it's, it's like me and Miller. You know, we start out talking about something else. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, then it's, there I was at 30,000 feet with nothing but a silkworm and a number nine needle. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Folks out there, uh, next week, next Friday, we're going to have J.R. Seeger on the show. He was uh, the leader of one of the first CIA paramilitary teams in Afghanistan after 9-11. He was uh, the team leader of Justin Sapp's team that we had on uh, a few weeks or a few months back. So we're excited to have Jr. on the show. Also, a pretty prolific author has written a lot of books. I was going to say the same. I was going to say pro a prolific yeah. Yeah, uh, fiction author, actually. Mm -hmm. Phen phenomenal work. Yeah. Yeah. So we will uh, we'll be here with JR next week. Jim, again, thank you so much, man. I hope everyone goes and checks out The Dreaming Circus, uh, some of his other works, Battle of Sorcerers, War Story, The Devil's Secret Name. Those are all terrific books. It's all in the description. It's down in the description. Link's down in the description. And remember Jim's message, there is a way, exactly. even if you don't see it right now. Adios, Jim. All right. Thanks, take care, Jim. Thanks, Jim.